Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar session, How to Build Responsive Teams. My name is Alex Mazurk with Quint Wellington Redwood, and I'll be your host today. Well, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Alex, and I'm joined today by our presenter today, which is uh, Tom Dimahowski. I just want to uh, cover a few ground rules for the webinar before we get started. First off, um, all audio is being tr transmitted by a computer. Um, everybody's muted, so uh, you can hear us, obviously, but we cannot hear you. Also, if you have any questions at any point during this webinar, on the right side of your uh, GoToWebinar screen, there should be a panel that says questions. Uh, please go ahead and ask a question at any portion um, dur during this webinar, and we'll have a session at the end in which I will read the accumulated questions aloud, and our presenter today will answer them for all to hear. And last off, um, we are recording this webinar today, and all attendees will be sent a recording later on, so if you need to leave early for any reason, uh, you will have all access to the content. Now, just a few things about our organization before we get started. Um, Quentin is uh, actually celebrating its 25-year anniversary this year. Uh, we started in 1992 over in Amsterdam, but today we're a completely global company with offices in uh, um, Philadelphia, um, Spain, um, India, and uh, Malaysia, and Japan as well. Um, we are founders of both the uh, Lean IT Association and uh, DASO, which is the DevOps uh, Agile Skills Organization. Um, we've uh, now we have 200 consultants, uh, well, more than 200 consultants, operating globally on just about every single continent, and we're proud to say that we train um, about 30,000 professionals every single year, from everything from um, idle to COVID to Lean IT, um, DevOps, you name it. So these are the six key areas in which uh, Quint helps. These are the challenges that we see in uh, IT and business today. Uh, first off, we help uh, organize IT. We help uh, blend technology and business, um, help companies and other organizations innovate across their ecosystems, um, especially like today and with Lean IT transforming to high performance. Uh, we help companies be smart with their data. And last off, uh, we'd like to help companies digitize their products and services. But without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our presenter today, Tom Demahowski. Thank you for joining us today, Tom. Oh, you're welcome, and thanks, Alex. And it's nice to meet you all this morning, at least virtually. Again, my name's Tom Demahowski. Um, today's agenda is going to be a little bit different, but as you can see in the picture, I'm sure you've had the same reaction. Uh-oh, the boss called me. He wants me to be on the XYZ team. And you're like, oh, no. So... What we thought we'd do today is talk a little bit about the characteristics of how teams are formed in IT. Um, how do you build a responsive team for success? And if you're in a team and things don't go quite right, what do you do? And then have a discussion around what are the key behaviors upon which teams in IT are built. But before, because this is a, uh, a series of uh, three webinars focused on lean and teams is one component of it, of it we're going to cover a... Um, the basics of lean so that the audience, uh, everybody in the audience is grounded on the basic concepts of lean before we get started. So let's talk about it. So what is lean? Well, lean is really the extension of lean manufacturing or basically lean services. And it's, uh, uh, in this case, it's applied in the context of IT. And it's the perfect, perfect, tool or method for IT because lean focuses on the elimination of wait time and waste that add, doesn't add value to a product or service. And if you think about what we do in IT, it's all that we do is wait. I'm waiting for somebody to complete a task on the project so I can do my task next. I'm waiting for a response to the incident I called in because I want to get on with my work. I'm waiting for somebody to call me back or for the system to respond so I can reset my password. So. Lean focused on IT, we term lean IT, and again, it's focused on the elimination of wait time and waste. So what does lean really do? Well, lean is focused on transforming value streams in IT. And if you think about what it is we do in IT, we only really do three things. Well, first, we're from the bottom up, we're providing a service so to help our business get results. But when people ask us to do things or when we look at what we really do in IT, we only do three things. People say, hey, I want you to keep all my stuff working, right? They want their application or their new functionality or their new PC as soon as they can. And they call up with questions. Give me advice on which application to use for this 
or how can I configure Microsoft Office to do X, Y, or Z? But it's only three things we do in IT. It's really, really simple. Now, why lean IT? Again, I mentioned we only do three things in IT, but uh, all of us in IT are struggling with the uh, same thing. We spend a lot of dollars, effort, and money on what we call burning capacity, or those things that we have to do to keep the lights on. And we're always at a short for working on new, innovative things that our organizations uh, want, or what we call really future value added activities. And the focus and the value proposition for lean in IT is trying to flip the ratio of burning capacity to earning capacity. And we do that by eliminating non-necessary value added activities, wait time and waste. And you start to flip that burning capacity into earning capacity. So how do you know if you're in a situation in case you're wondering about, well, well, I'm not sure that we we're burning too much capacity. Just think to yourself, if the organization is moving, if you're moving from meeting to meeting and you never have enough time to do your work and there's just more meetings to go to, um, that's an indication that the burning capacity has overwhelmed the uh, uh, earning capacity and there's a lot of wait time and non-necessary value activities in the organization. Just a thing for you to think about. Now, I know you're chuckling looking at the picture, but here's how most teams are formed in IT, or at least it's been my experience. There's a team working on something or something goes wrong and they want to form a team to fix this and people are jumping from the, you know, people are jumping in the fire to go around and, and help. Yes, it's kind of funny, but unfortunately for all of us in IT, uh, it's true. And what's even more important is when we do it that way, it doesn't work well. And because... We have people jumping into teams. They're not sure of their role. They're not sure what the risks are. They're not sure they have organization supports. And they're not even sure if what the overall objectives of the team are and um, are they going to be able to be successful with what they have to do. They want to know, does it align with the strategy, et cetera. All those things that people at the table are thinking about um, are the things that happen and the things that we think about as to why teams may not work well. In addition, to those. Uh, what you also see is many teams today are some type of uh, fragmented productivity programs with a clear lack of expectations for measure, measurable results. In other words, the purpose of the team isn't crystal clear and the actual outcome or the result isn't clear. Um, the accountability for results isn't clear. If I don't have a clear definition and a clear outcome, what is the team uh, accountable for? Um, we may not have the capability, the right skills for quality execution because we just put a team together or we parachuted or the wrong person jumped into the fire. And the other thing that we do is we continually introduce new people to a team whose second or third job it is, is to work on process transformation or anything else uh, as part of this team. And last thing is we never standardize the same tools, methods, and techniques that teams are supposed to use. Or do we train people on how to work together in teams? So all those things contribute to um, the lack of, let's say for now, a team success. So the other thing that's been happening in IT is that teams have become large, virtual, diverse, and fortunately for us, composed of very highly educated people. But, and the teams are not only cross-organizational, but they've expanded to include critical partners um, and uh, critical business partners or service providers that make up today's complex ecosystem. Current results, or excuse me, the current research shows that those same four qualities that make the team successful also undermine the success of the team and that these complex teams who are large, virtual, diverse, and composed of highly educated uh, specialists are less likely to share, share information and knowledge freely, learn from one another, easily, easily shift the workload back and forth to mitigate bottlenecks, or help one another collaborate to meet deadlines. Most importantly, they're less likely to want each other to uh, succeed. That's the latest research out there on teams. Now, in IT, 
we all know that teams are generally formed along four lines, or there are some combination of those four lines. There are technical teams, which is a traditional team within IT, um, where people are responsible for a similar part of the hardware or the software. Uh, there are project teams who are assembled to create new outcomes or new products or several services, or simply to work on large pieces of work. A service-oriented team. Service-oriented team is one that's responsible by ensuring that one or more IT services are delivered seamlessly. Um, an example could be a DevOps team. Uh, but a DevOps team is also an example of a customer-oriented team. It's a team that's focused on managing and or delivering the services for a specific customer. The fact is, is I, I unfortunately or fortunately brought up DevOps, all those things contained together can be within the DevOps team. But typically, in the past, we've seen teams organized along those four lines. But um, let's take, for example, uh, of today's teams. What happens when we integrate development and operations? What are the barriers? Well, typically, what happens is you take the development guys and the ops guys and you put them together, and they have conflicting goals. The goals that they work toward are different because their jobs are different. Their knowledge base is different. One knows about developing apps, the other one knows about uh, uh, operating the uh, infrastructure. So their training and capabilities are different. The expectations and the metrics that they use to measure success are different. And what is considered good performance in development and ops is also different. So there's many barriers using DevOps as an example. But what's important here is that uh, teams focus on the behavior and mindset, how they're organized, that they have similar knowledge about automation, flow, and performance. And I'm gonna take flow out for a second and explain that to you. So in this case, flow is used in the context of lean. And from a lean perspective, it's defined as a set of tasks or information as it moves through a process or value stream from the first step to the last step without interruption. Meaning that is if the process stops or if one segment takes longer than expected or it's not going fast enough and you're building up a backlog of tasks, an example would be incidents. If you have an inventory of incidents in your organization, then you by default in terms of lean do not have flow. And if you have flow, um, it'll take less, less effort to uh, operate the process. The, the math and everything uh, out there continually works with Lane. So the important things, uh, taking the DevOps example, are that, hey, the behaviors and mindset are aligned. So how do we do that? We make sure that people have and understand that they have clear common goals, that their expectations are clear, that the metrics for success are clear. We focus on how they're organized, meaning that everybody has a clear role and responsibility. People are familiar not only with the automation, but the tools and methods that they use. And that the team agrees uh, on performance. So those are the things that are important to focus on because there are many barriers to that, to success in the team. So as we know, cross-functional and organizational teams are the core of IT value delivery, right? And what's important here, is that whatever the team is it's delivering the work not only is the uh, does the role of the team have to be crystal clear but it has to be lined up in the organization so that all the work orders and project initiations are very clear that it's in the plan for the year that it's in the long-term development plan and it aligns with the business need and strategy that alignment or line of sight if you will for the team from the top to what the team has to deliver has to be um, uh, very, very clear. The fact is, is in, that's important because cross-functional teams, as in the DevOps example, are a group of people with different expertise working toward a common goal, and they may not be familiar with each other, each other's skills, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the other thing is teams may come from outside the organization. So. Again, these cross-functional teams are the core of IT value delivery in today's environment. The key thing to remember is that teams, according to Bill Taylor, 
players win games, teams win championships. And if we want to work together, we have to work together as a team. Now, um, research has shown that there's a number of key behavioral success factors that make teams uh, successful. And those behavioral success factors are starting with investing in signature relationship practices. So what's that mean? It means that it'd be really, really nice to see the executives in the enterprise investing in this collaborative behavior. Perhaps it's open floor plans to um, foster communications. And it's demonstrating their the executive's commitment to collaboration because these more open floor plans, as an example, uh, are a highly visible investment. And it says that, hey, working together uh, and collaborating are very important. The second thing is, is modeling collabor collaborative behavior. Typically at companies where senior exec executives demonstrate highly collaborative behavior, teams collaborate well. If the executives aren't demonstrating the collaborative behavior, that really uh, shows up in the organization and the success of other teams. So creating a gift culture. So what does a gift culture mean? Well, it means mentoring and coaching. And there are formal mentoring and coaching uh, programs and there are informal ones. And research shows that the informal day-to-day, -day, uh, uh, the day-to-day -day coaching and mentoring help build the networks and, and the teams necessary for people to easily work across the uh, corporate stovepipes and uh, corporate bounding, uh, boundaries. It's a very important point. The other thing is ensuring that they have the right skills. So what does having the requisite skills really mean? It means that things like building relationships, how to do communications and resolve conflicts, that the organization provide training, probably out of HR, to teach employees, well, how do you go about building good relationships? How do we communicate well with each other? And how do we resolve conflicts? Um, having the requisite skills are part of something that can be provided to ensure that teams are more successful in an organization. Um, supporting a strong sense of community. Now, the bottom line here is that if the culture shows a strong sense of community, people are more comfortable and they'll more easily reach out to others and more likely share knowledge and information and things of that nature. So this creating the sense of community and having a strong sense of community contributes significantly to the success of teams. The next one, assigning team leaders that are both task and relationship oriented. So that's a really critical one. And there's always been debate around this. The debate is traditionally focused on uh, whether a task or relationship oriented leadership, whether, excuse me, whether task or relationship oriented leadership is better. But the bottom line is, is that the research shows that in fact, they're both successful to leading a team. Teams typically um, start with, um, or lean more heavily on a task orientation when they're first starting out. And then it shifts as the project begins to start up and mature, it shifts toward more a relationship orientation once the project is in full swing. And that ability for the leader to be both task and relationship oriented is actually very critical to a team's success. Um, building on heritage relationships. So what does that mean? It means that if all the people on the team are strangers, they may be reluctant to share knowledge so good practice is to put at least a few people on the team who know one another. That way, it'll enable the um, sharing of information and knowledge. It'll make everybody more comfortable with, uh, with each other at the beginning. And finally, understanding role clarity and task. It's very important that um, not only does the team have a purpose for why it exists, but that the clarity of each of the team members' roles and what tasks they're responsible for and how they relate to each other are always clear. It'll make um, uh, 
teams, uh, if you will, uh, much more successful. So now, what happens if you're in a team and it's been going along well, but all of a sudden it goes wrong? What is that really, what do you do? So the first thing is, is that if you remember the previous slide about the uh, eight things to help build uh, responsive teams um, and some of the comments there, the first thing is to trust one another. So if things are going wrong, you have to trust your other team members and you hopefully will have built up that trust. And it's that trust that's going to take you through when things go wrong. Um, second thing is engage in conflicts on ideas. So conflict is normal, especially over differing approaches and differing ideas. And it's important to support and engage in that conflict and discussion of ideas. It'll help get through um, not only what went wrong, but uh, how do you go by and fix it. Um, as a team, committing to decisions and plans of action. So once you sort out the path forward is you have to get commit commitment to the decision and the plans of actions. Typically, teams work with a definition of what commitment means. And we'll talk about that a little later, but it really means that, hey, I'm committed to this. And um, from a decision standpoint, you can live with the decision. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you can live with it. Next thing is holding each other accountable. You know what? If we hold each other accountable to the task that we're supposed to do and share when we're ahead or behind, uh, what will happen is, is you'll work through when things go wrong. And finally is, is working on collective results. Not my results, not your results, but the collective results. So you focus on back to trust one another and help each other on the team. So these are the things that you can focus on and make sure you review in your mind and you review, you focus on with the team when things do go wrong. So in the previous slide, we focused a little bit about uh, commitment and not just compliance. For teams to be successful, because people can choose how they engage, um, they have to be committed to the team and the outcome. Now, what's the difference between commitment and compliance? Well, let's use an example. Um, uh, I was with a company, and they created a new expense reporting system. No matter how much you hated the expense reporting system or disliked it or thought its functionality uh, wasn't useful or it was awkward to use, the instructions weren't good enough, whatever complaint that you have, you know what? It really didn't matter. What mattered was is if you wanted to get reimbursed for your expense, you had to use the system. Otherwise, you weren't getting your money. And that is a good example of compliance. So it's really comes from the negative side and people may feel threatened by the change, but there's a new way and we have to comply and there's no choice. When you're working together in teams, it's a bit different. As I said, every team member chooses how they engage. And um, that's really very really important. They go from awareness to understanding, to engagement, to testing, to action, to finally being committed. And everybody will travel some sort of similar commitment path. And it's important that team members help each other and focus on not only their commitment to the team, but their commitment to the outcome. But in any way you look at it, working together in teams uh, can be a challenge. So what I've done for here for you is I created a little back of the envelope tool. And there are five categories down the left, organizational scope, work complexity, political resistance, cultural change, and team capability. And then from left to right, it goes from the least challenging to the most challenging. Well, if you print this out and give it to all your team members when you're in a team, and you have them circle uh, for each one of the five categories down the left, whether they think this is uh, least challenging or most challenging, and then you score it, with level one scoring a one, level three scoring a three, and you add it up to an average, and you get a score. If your score is greater than two, you have a fairly challenging uh, environment and set of tasks and things for your uh, team to work on. Why that's good to know is because if it is challenging, 
you recognize at the beginning that it's a challenging environment and you can start to work the plan for your team of not only what's the work we have to accomplish, but what do we have to do to get better at the team because our team has to work well for the work to accomplish. So I hope you find that all useful and give it a try in one of your teams. So finally, let's talk about the, uh, in summary, what are the key takeaways from this? The first thing is, is to make sure that teams have a clearly defined purpose to exist. So why, what's their business purpose? Why does it exist? And what is it that the team's going to accomplish? Or what service uh, is the team going to be going to provide? Keep in mind that this purpose has to be just crystal clear. Um, the second thing is, key thing is to select team leaders with both task and uh, who are both task oriented and relationship oriented. It's very, very important because that relationship is, is, is in the building of those relationships, not only with the leader, with each other and with all your external stakeholders are going to contribute them a great deal to the team's success. And then finally, make sure not only is a clear purpose for the team, but there's clarity within the team for what are everybody's roles and what are the tasks that they're supposed to be focused on. The more clarity there is for roles and tasks. Um, if somebody gets the header, uh, header behind and people have to jump in uh, to help, um, it'll give you a better clarity in knowing uh, where you are and what help they need. So I hope you find that helpful and I enjoyed chatting with you all today. I'm going to pass um, our conversation back to Alex. Yes, uh, thanks for the great uh, presentation today, Tom. Um, we do have a question or two that is in there. As I remind everybody, it's an open forum, so go ahead and ask a question if uh, maybe one of these inspires you. Um, the first question that we have here, Tom, is um, what do you see as maybe the most important factor in integrating an ops team with a dev team? Well, now that's a complicated question, and I'm sure it's a question that you're all thinking about, as uh, have we many times. The first thing to keep in mind is that there's no cookie cutter approach to development and ops. Second thing to keep in mind is when you look at DevOps or the concept of DevOps, all the concepts, all the base level concepts in DevOps and even Agile are all lean concepts. So lean applies to all of them. But um, to answer the question, the key thing is what I was just saying in the summary is to make sure that the purpose of the team is clear and the roles and responsibilities are clear. And that finally, team members are cross-trained on each other's tools and methods. Not completely, but so that they're familiar with them in DevOps, because Dev and Ops are totally different. And it'll foster that behavior and mindset that you need to get them to work together. So I hope that answer is helpful for you. Okay, thanks, Tom. And the second question that we have here is, um, can you add some more detail about what you mean by creating a gift culture? Sure. So the gift culture, the way it's defined in here, the way we define gift culture is that it's to look at the idea of mentoring and coaching becoming uh, embedded in the culture uh, of the organization. And um, this is, should be done throughout the company. And it's an important role for executives to ensure that there's um, not only both formal mentoring processes in place with clear roles and responsibilities, but the less informal processes. So um, where mentoring is integrated into the day-to-day -day activities. Uh, when you look at the research, it turns out that while both were important, um, those mentoring activities that were integrated into your everyday behaviors are more likely to increase collaborative behavior. Bottom line is, is daily coaching helps to establish a gift culture in place of a more transactional culture. And when you get further into our webinars, within Lean is embedded something called the Lean Management System. And this coaching and mentoring are part of the Lean uh, methodology and um, tools, not only for cascading goals, but having day starts and week starts 
and having those conversations, uh, daily performance conversations throughout the organization. So very good question. I hope that helps. Last off, Tom is uh, accessible. That's his information right there. Feel free to ask for him directly if you have any questions whatsoever. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.